All right, let's go ahead and pray. The Lord be with you. Father, thank you for bringing us here. Lord, I pray that you will use your word this morning um, to uh, guide us and direct us. Um, Lord, I pray that you will give each of us soft hearts and attentive minds. Help us to uh, want and and desire eagerly to hear you speak to us today. Um, Lord, I pray that what I say will be in keeping with your word and that nothing I say will um, depart from it. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Okay, well, uh, we are today again back in the vineyard. This is, I think, the last vineyard parable that we'll deal with for some time. I'm not quite sure, but I think that's the way it is. And this is the hardest hitting. I mean, last week was pretty pretty hard hitting. This is going to be a little bit more uh, than that. Um, Let's go ahead and remember what's going on. Um, This is uh, the same confrontation that we talked about last week between Jesus and the temple authorities. We're dropping right back into that confrontation today. The day before this little exchange takes place, um, Jesus entered the temple and he just wrecked the place. Remember, he he went in, uh, he just turned over tables, he whipped people. He was not not the, the fuzzy, warm, cuddly Jesus that we like to think of. He was the angry Jesus coming home and seeing that um, his kids had had a party in the house. He was taking care of business, and he was overturning the way things were in the temple. That was the day before this. Today, he's back. He's been preaching in the temple of the Lord about himself. He's been calling attention to his purpose and to his mission. He's been receiving and accepting praise from the lips of people in the temple. And he's been teaching with authority. We've been talking about that. He wasn't footnoting anybody. He wasn't basing what he's saying on anybody else's teaching. He was was just out there preaching um, about himself, basing what he says on his own authority. Now, he was then challenged. We saw, we talked about this week, last week also, um, when he was challenged by the chief priests and the elders, he tells them, and they are the highest and most powerful leaders in the nation, both religious and civic, he tells the chief priests and the elders, the Sanhedrin, you're all frauds. You're all fakes. You're a bunch of liars. You do good works on the outside, but inside you're rotting. Right? That's what the parable of the two sons was all about. The first son that says, uh, excuse me, the second son that says yes, and then goes away and does no, and disobeys the father. That's the chief priests and the elders. That's you, he's saying. You're fakes. You're frauds. Now, just in case they missed that point, they say they don't quite get that yet, he goes on to tell the parable that um, we have today, which begins there in verse 33. And he begins... Um, with this master of the house, you can look at this, who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. Now, if you've been here for the last three sermons, what does what does the vineyard represent? Heaven? Kingdom? Kingdom? King, the kingdom of God, yeah. And when we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the baby angels and the harps and the clouds and the wings, right? Is that what we're talking about? No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the place where God's will is done. The place where people are called to do God's will and they're carrying that out on earth and in heaven. That's the kingdom of, that's the kingdom of God. Um, so um, at this time... The people remembered, at the time that Jesus is talking, Israel was called to be the kingdom of God on earth. You all know that. That's what the Old Testament is all about. Israel being called out from among the people, peoples of the nations and being called to be the kingdom of God on earth. A holy nation set apart to reveal God's mercy and God's beauty and God's holiness, and to bear God's fruit, and to draw all peoples of all nations back to Yahweh. That was their mission. That was their purpose. By the way, where is the kingdom of God today? Right right here. Not not the building. Us. Right? 
God has, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, he has called you out of the nations, and your mission is the very same thing, the same kind of mission that he gave to Israel, to be the kingdom of God on earth. Every local church is called to be an outpost of his kingdom. Now, here's, here's why I want to make sure we get this, because here's the problem. You ask most believers in Jesus, why did God send his son? And the answer will likely be something like, to save me. God sent his son to die to save me. And, yes, that's true. God pours out his grace and he saves you and sets you into his kingdom. But it doesn't stop there. His saving work in your life isn't ultimately about you. So if you stop there and say, this is God's purpose and mission on earth is to save me, then everything in your Christian walk becomes all about you. How am I feeling about this sermon? I'm not sure if I really like the music today. What ministry shall I be involved in? Which will feed me most in the church? Right? Then it's all about you. Because that's God's purpose anyway, is saving you. But, it's not. You're called by Christ to expand the kingdom of God by pouring out all the good stuff that God gives you into the world by serving all and making disciples of all. That's your task. That's your calling. Notice that in all these vineyard stories, they're all being called in the vineyard not just to sit down. Hang out. They're being called into the vineyard to work. One day, Jesus will return and he will establish his dominion over all the cosmos. Until then, he works through the church, that's you, that's me, to extend his kingdom by proclaiming and acting out the good news that God um, will have mercy on all who turn to Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the great news. You're, you are a missionary and an evangelist in that epic story, calling people to come to know Jesus Christ. Now, as soon as I say that, knowing that I, these are a lot of Anglicans and Episcopalians here, I know that, and even some might have gotten this from your old church, the response might be, I'm not called to that. You know, my gifting isn't really evangelism or, or, missionary, or missionary. My, my calling is, you know, I'm kind of a more behind-the-scenes guy. So, you know, I'm, I'm really thinking good thoughts about mission and thinking good thoughts about evangelism. I really want people to come to Jesus and be saved, and I want them not to be nasty and depraved, and I want them to all have everything they need in Jesus Christ. But I'm not going to do anything about it because that's for missionaries and evangelists. And that would be fine if Jesus said, go into all the world, those of you who are called, and uh, make disciples of all nations. But he didn't. He was speaking to his disciples. More than the twelve. How many here consider yourself, if you consider yourself a disciple of Jesus, raise your hand. Okay, good. Okay, you are also an evangelist and a missionary. You are. Whether you like it or not. And if you, if you are not acting out in those ways, in wherever you are, in your workplace, in your school, wherever, then you are not acting out discipleship. You're not really being a disciple of Jesus, right? And this parable has something very important to say to you. All right. So the elders and the chief priests know that when Jesus, like we do, that when Jesus starts talking about the vineyard, he's talking about the kingdom of God. Because, as we saw in our first reading, that image goes way back, and it was used by the, by the um, prophets. It was used by Isaiah, in particular. And I'll re- remember, just if you had your Bibles marked for the Old Testament, you can look back there. You don't have to, but Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, and this is important. Um, there, through Isaiah, um, we read this. My beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill, 
He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and he hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grace, but it yielded wild grapes. And then God speaks, when I looked for grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I'll break down its wall. I'm skipping a little bit. I'll break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. Right? So the point of that parable is this. God, or that story in Isaiah is this. God established Israel to be his kingdom with that mission, right? To reveal his light to the world. He called them out. He delivered them. He provided for them. He protected them. But the fruit Israel bore was idolatry, right? Worshiping other gods. It was self-righteousness, right? It was disdain toward the very people that God set them apart to draw in. Right? We see that in the attitudes of the chief priests and the scribes. And so God said, no more. I'm taking you out. You, you can't be in my kingdom anymore. You're, you're done. I'm going to break down the wall. Now, here's the thing. The elders and the chief priests, the people Jesus is speaking to, believe that Isaiah 5 refers to other people. How many... I, I read the Bible that way. I'll be reading a verse, and I'll say, man, I wish Anne would read that because she could really change her life in this way. I would love... I'm gonna, you know, I'm going I'm to leave the Bible open and they circle this verse and the death because it's all about her. We often do that, and the, and, the, and the chief priests and the elders did that as well. They don't look at the Bible and say, well, how does this speak to me? They say, how does this speak to everyone else? They knew that God sent the Babylonians 400 years past to destroy the temple, and that the Babylonians had carried Jerusalem into exile. And so in their minds, the, the prophecy in Isaiah 5 had already been fulfilled. You know, God did say, hey, I'm going, to have, I'm, going to, I'm going to judge you guys, but that's been done a long time ago. Now God's restored us to Jerusalem. We've rebuilt the temple. Now we're just waiting for the Messiah to come and reward the righteous, right? Um, destroy the wicked and rule all the nations. That's what we're waiting for. This parable by Jesus is designed to uh, destroy and undermine that assumption on their part. That this is about other people. People in the past. Now, a wealthy landowner would commonly rent out a vineyard. And probably some of the people who were listening to Jesus, who would have been among the wealthiest in the nation, had vineyards that they had rented out. Um, his tenants would farm it. They would uh, do everything that a good farmer would do. And they would uh, take most of the fruit themselves, but they would give a cut of the produce um, to the owner, and that's how the owner um, was able to, or the owner would make some money off of that. Um, in this particular case, the owner has taken very, very good care of his tenants. He's built a wall, a wine press, a watchtower, everything that they will need uh, to produce fruit. And what's interesting, as opposed to Isaiah chapter 5, here they do produce fruit. Look at verse 34. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. Verse 35. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Now, in Isaiah's parable, the fruit was wild. The fruit was bad. In Jesus' parable, the tenants are. It's the tenants that are bad. They're the bad fruit in this parable. They refuse to pay, and then they also kill his servants. Now, strangely, and this is where this parable begins to go a little bit weird, okay? Strangely, he sends three. They get whacked. What does he do then? He sends three more. Again, he sent other servants, verse 36, more than the first, and they did the same thing to them. Now, again, if you're listening to this parable as a chief priest or, um, or someone who has a vineyard, definitely incredulity begins to creep in. If that were me, if that were my vineyard, they didn't pay me, I'd be down there already taking care of business. If they hurt my servants, oh man, it's over. I'm going down there myself and taking care of those guys. 
That's what any vineyard thinker would be thinking. Same way as if someone, you, someone owes you rent and they don't pay rent. You kick them out of your house, right? Now, only days before, as Jesus topped the Mount of Olives and saw Jerusalem laying uh, before him, he said something very important to help us understand this parable. You don't have to look it up, but it is in Luke chapter 13, verse 34. He says this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would have it not. You would have it not. God sent his servants to his vineyard Israel, saying, Repent, turn, do what I've called you to do. Over and over again, they are beaten, killed, stoned. The elders and the chief priests know this history, but they say, not us. If we'd been there, we would have listened. Jesus says, guess what? You are there. Not only have your forefathers neglected and refused to listen to the prophets, but John the Baptist, the final prophet, has come to you and he's spoken to you. And what did you do? You rejected him. And now look what you're doing. You're rejecting the one who he pointed to as coming to cleanse you of your sins. That's you. Look in the mirror. Now, as at this point, we are tempted to say, yeah, those stupid people. Those idiots. If I'd been there. But the New Testament tells us that the same proclivity of the people of God to reject the prophets and the people who are sent from God to speak to them continues in the church today. Timothy, Paul's young protege, was having some trouble in his congregation. We don't know exactly what it was, but he was a young guy, and for some reason the people weren't willing to listen to what he said. He was preaching, and they, would, they didn't want to hear it. And so we can assume, we don't know for sure, but it seems like Timothy wrote a letter to Paul. Paul, what do I do? No one's listening to me. I'm a young guy. I'm trying to preach the gospel. I'm trying to preach the word, but nobody's, um, nobody's listening. Um, what do I do? Now, if that was like a 21st century letter, we might expect Paul to write back, well, you know, maybe some drama would work. Maybe you've got to have a little play. Like instead of preaching, you just have like a little movie or something. Or maybe you should talk more about puppies and kittens and poems. Or maybe you should um, work in some more entertainment into the way you're talking. Maybe that's what you should do. Some way to you know, pique their attention and get them to, to perk up and listen to the word of God so that they won't, they won't get bored and go, maybe that's what's going on here. That's what maybe we expect in the 21st century. But here's what Paul said. This is what Paul said back to Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season. That is right now, Timothy, when people aren't, don't want to hear your preaching, don't want to, hear you, don't want to listen to what you're saying. Preach the word in season and out of season. Um, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. In other words, don't stop. Timothy, what you're experiencing is what the people of God have always done. So just, just keep it up. Even when people 
despise the word of God, don't stop preaching it. Now, why? Uh, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you go to drama or just, you know, why, wouldn't you, why wouldn't you just skew that and do something that people want to hear and would come to listen to? Why would you continue to do something that people aren't um, hearing? And Paul answers that question here um, in 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. In other words, Timothy, what you're doing, you may not know it, but what you're doing when you preach the word of God, when you share the word of God with others, when you speak in a way that is consistent with the word of God, God is working through that. He is building people up. He is training them. He is rebuking them when necessary. And he is bringing them to um, his son, Jesus. That's what happens. Now, my job would be a lot easier, and those who teach and, and preach or in other ministries in this church would be a lot easier if we could just write up a speech on what I think about the issues of the day. I have lots of opinions. I'd love to share them with you, um, but I won't. Um, if I could just do that, Write up a speech, share a heart-tugging story or two, and finish it with a nice bit of uh, life coaching advice, then it would be a lot easier, but you would be poorer for it. God uses the preaching of the Word of God to speak directly to you. He uses your mission group teachers and leaders. He uses your Bible study teachers and leaders to speak directly to you through His Word. But what if you don't want to hear it? Now, I know as, as good Christians, of course we want to hear it. Of course we want to hear the word of God. That's why we're here. You think that. But then some of us stay up till three the night before, right? So you come and you're just drifting off. So maybe our actions don't necessarily play out what we say we believe. What if the words of the prophets, what if the words of the prophets and the apostles offend you? Worse, what if the words of the prophets and the apostles bore you? You're in a much better place spiritually if you are offended by the word of God than you are if you're bored by the Word of God. That's the, that's the end of hatred is indifference. What if you've come this morning to be uplifted and instead you have to hear a long sermon about people being slaughtered in a vineyard? What if you'd rather hear another sermon about another parable, about another thing that really impacts you where you are in your life? What if you'd rather check out the bulletin than open your Bible? Well then, just maybe, just maybe, you're right there with the tenants. It's not so much that you want to kill the prophets, you just rather they shut up and stop talking and let us go on with our Sunday. Not that I'm a prophet, but the apostles were. You'd rather find a way to ignore the word of God than heed it. And I think that's, if that's you, I think that's because somewhere and at some point you've decided that they are not really talking to you. That's what the chief priests and the elders did, right? Oh no, John isn't speaking about us. We don't need to repent. He's speaking about other people. Somewhere along the line, you've decided that they're not really talking about you or to you. Don't. When you come to church on Sunday morning, when you open your Bible in the morning to read it, when you go to Bible study during the week, don't harden your heart that way. That is dangerous. 
Every time you hear God's word preached, taught, or you read it yourself, every time it is directed to you. So what you need to do, and what I need to do too as a preacher, because I'm preaching to myself too, is I need to attend to it with every fiber of my being. I want to hear it. I want to pray that God will open my ears and open my heart and open my mind so that whatever's being said, I can hear it. It has nothing to do with the person, whether he's preaching as a good preacher or a bad preacher or a boring preacher or an exciting preacher. It has to do with the word that is being preached. So we all need to come here or wherever we go to hear the word of God preached and taught with a mind and a heart eager to hear. Get sleep on Saturday night. Just a little. Enough to stay awake. Sorry, I don't mean to yell. I do mean to yell at you. But I would rather, I'd rather yell at you so that you get something out of this time that you're sacrificing. Don't harden your heart. Every time we hear God's word, every time it's preached or taught or read, it's directed to you and you shun it You ignore it, you neglect it at your peril. God is patient. Everlasting, well, he's patient. I was going to say everlasting patience. Because the parable goes, and we notice this, the parable goes beyond the realm of credibility. What vineyard owner would do, have the patience that this vineyard owner has, patience bordering on foolishness. No one would send servant after servant to these rebellious and greedy and murderous tenants. But God does. God sends prophet after prophet and apostle. The apostles to us. He gives you teachers and preachers. Our wrath is quick. My kids don't listen to me, that's it. Say no to me, spanking. Our wrath is quick. God holds back his hand. Why? Because he loves the tenants. You gotta see this. I mean, yeah, Jesus is hitting these guys as hard as you could possibly hit. But underneath that is he loves them. He wants them to hear. He wants them to turn. In every call like this, there's also a call to repent. Come back, you can. There's still time. God loves the tenants and he gives them every opportunity to bear good fruit. Maybe you've heard before God's direct call to turn away from your present path, whatever it is, and commit your life to Christ. And you've shut it down. And you've ignored it. And you read your bulletin or whatever. God will look like a fool to give you every chance to hear him and turn. He doesn't have anything to prove. But there is an end to his patience. After killing his servants, you see there in verse 37, the owner sends his son. And he says, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. Now the tenant's reasoning on the surface seems ridiculous. How would killing uh, the vineyard owner's son make them heirs of the vineyard? There's no law in the ancient world or our world that would make that possible. But Jesus is going more for the uh, psychology here than for the law. The elders and the chief priests have rejected John, and in a few days they will murder God's son. Why? 
they want, like the tenants, the blessings of the vineyard, but they don't want the vineyard owner. They want all the, 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 the kingdom has to offer, but they don't want the king. And so, they act as they act. Now, you might say, reading this parable, in defense of the elders and the chief priests, and in contrast with the, with the tenants, well, the elders and the chief priests didn't know that Jesus was God's son. They thought he was a heretic. The tenants, on the other hand, knew that these were messengers sent from, or servants sent from, um, the vineyard owner. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit of a different story here. But listen... When you're told the truth, when you are told the truth and you are given enough evidence to believe that it is true, enough evidence necessary to establish that it is true, but refuse to listen, you cannot plead ignorance. You cannot plead ignorance. They were told over and over again in the prophets and by John himself. And the message that Jesus proclaimed about himself was backed up by miraculous sign after miraculous sign that could only be done by Jesus himself. Or could only be done by God himself. It's not that they could not see, it's that they would not see. Because seeing would mean accepting a place among the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Seeing would mean entering God's kingdom through Jesus and forsaking the kingdoms they built around themselves. What about you? Everyone sitting here today has heard God's call to repent, to surrender to Jesus Christ, and to be his disciple. Right? Not just to stop with God saves me, but to be his disciple. Everyone has heard it. Everyone has sufficient evidence to believe it. No one here can plead ignorance. No one. There is a terrible price to pay for those who sit under and within the realm where the word of God is preached and do not receive it. Turn to Hebrews. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to show you. I didn't mean to have you turn here, but I'm going to do it. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Beginning in, it looks like verse 3. Or maybe verse 4. I'm not trying to scare you, but I am trying to warn you. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who've tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God. Do you hear that? For those who have been enlightened by the preaching of the word of God, those who've heard the word, those who take part and participate in receiving the heavenly fruit of communion and are in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. For those people who are there Sunday after Sunday and reject it, and reject it, never receive it, never swallow. They taste, they don't take in. There's no going back at some point. Because you won't want to. The fruit of the vineyard is repentance for your sins and trust in and obedience to 
Jesus Christ. And let me ask every single one of you here, and I'm asking myself too, are you bearing that fruit? If in any way, this morning, the answer is no, you need to repent. You need to repent. Offer that up to God. He will forgive you. That's what Jesus came for. One of the things that Jesus came for. He will forgive you. Now, if the gospel were, Jesus has come to bring you joy and give you meaning in your life, which he does, but that's not the purpose. If that were the gospel, then you could set Jesus alongside Athena and Apollo and Buddha and Muhammad and be just fine. But Jesus came to rescue you and me from the judgment that our sins deserve. So there is no other option here. That's what Jesus means when he goes right there and he says to those guys, Hey, I'm the cornerstone. As you throw me out of the vineyard... Know this, there is no way, and there's no other way in. There's no other way to have peace with God but through the person you're killing. Know that. Follow me, he says, and then you will be saved. Reject me, and you'll be judged according to your works, and you will not survive that judgment. Now, in good rabbinic fashion, Jesus allows his hearers to end the parable for him when he asks them, what will the vineyard owner do to those tenants? Now, probably at this point, they're still thinking that um, Jesus is talking about vineyards. So, thinking of their own vineyards and not their own souls, they answer. He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him fruit in their due seasons. And they pronounced their own sentence. This parable is tough. It's unpleasant to hear about the judgment of God. It's unpleasant to preach about the judgment of God. I don't enjoy it. But it would be worse not to hear it. If my doctor knows I have a deadly but curable infection, I don't want him to worry about ruining my day. I want him to tell me. Jesus tells these parables because we are right now in the time, in the epic of God's patience. Where the offer to come in is open. He has sent his son to offer mercy, forgiveness, and eternal life to all who hear and receive him. So let me say, for those who are on the edge this morning and considering, considering Jesus, this is the moment of God's patience. His mercy is outstretched to you. His hands are reaching out to you. He loves you. Turn, repent, trust in him, and give your life to him today. Today. There will be people to pray with you after in the back if you decide to do that today. For others who may be assuming too much, let me ask you a question. Are you bearing good fruit for the glory of God? A good tree bears good fruit. That means your life now, the things you think, the things you say, the things you do, will, will, if you are a disciple, look like a disciple. You cannot ride on your baptism. I'm glad you did it. You can't ride on it. You cannot ride on a conversion experience you had at nine. Glad you're converted. Good job. Thanks. Glad. If your life does not reflect Jesus Christ in the world, then there's a real possibility you may not be his disciple.
because that's what disciples do. You are not saved by your works. You are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. There is no work that you can do to earn your way into the kingdom. You are not saved by your works, but your works manifest whether or not you are saved. So if you don't have them, repent. Repent. And surrender to Jesus Christ. Finally, for our disciples, for those whose life, if you look back, you can see increasing fruit being born, um, changed life, changed mind, changed heart, changed works, all of that stuff going on. Let me ask you a question in closing. Are you letting God's word direct your work and your life in the vineyard? Or are you coasting? Right? Or do you come to Bible study? Do you come to your morning studies in, the, in your own Bible? Do you come to here with just a heart aflame and desirous to hear God's words? Do you know exactly how to carry that out into the world? Are you looking for that? Or are you just going to church another day? Are you testing your works in light of what God says? Are you letting God's word direct your work? I'll stop here. If you find that you need to repent of anything or speak to God about anything or set things at right with the Lord, there will be people in the back of the church and you can go back there and pray and I invite you to do so. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord be with you. Father, these have been a really difficult series of sermons. Um, I thank you that you, you are the truth and you have not hidden the truth even though it does at some points make us uncomfortable. I pray, Lord, that this morning you will um, use, through your Holy Spirit, you will use your word to reveal to each and every one of us things for which we must repent. Help us see the ways, Lord, in, in which we have acted like the tenants. Identify those things in our life that need to go. And then, Lord, don't leave us there. Um, give us the power to give those up. Lord, we thank you that your blood was shed on the cross so that all who believe in you will not have to face the consequences for our disobedience. And we thank you for that, Father. But I pray um, that we, now that we are here, that we are able, that we see um, your will for our lives and we carry that out as your disciples. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together and profess our faith.